If you like this episode, please subscribe, share with others, rate and review so we can continue to bring you great programming. This is The Thing About Cars, a podcast for car enthusiasts and the people who love them. I have FIA news today. Say what, Misty? I have FIA news today. Excellent. We got a full agenda. Hello, this is The Thing About Cars. Um... I'm Mickey Desai. Around the table, we've got all the way in the Netherlands, as always. Misty, how are you, Misty? Not moist, unlike <laughs> Spa. <laughs> Tim, how goes it, Tim? Uh, fantastic, although I am a bit damp. You're a bit damp? Damp, yes. I oh, okay. Had to do it's... some cleanup outside. You know, uh, it. I was going to say, it's not raining here in Atlanta today. No, uh, it's, it's a self-induced dampness. <laughs> self-induced dampness. I like that. Uh, ben, how are you, sir? Oh, well, wonderfully dry, but I imagine I'll be getting sweaty later when I haul all my gear down to band practice. Ah, oh, yes. I'm going to attempt to change a headlight bulb today, which normally isn't a big deal, except in this car it requires taking out the battery. So I have to disconnect the entire battery and hope I can still get my car, my hand, my large hand, into that tiny space to get that stupid bulb out. So that's that kind of like a car I used to have. Yeah. yeah. I have staff for that. <laughs> We have a, a trivia question that Tim gave us last week that we ended up not using, Tim. I apologize. Uh, Would you like to read that one or shall I do that one? Uh, yeah, I got it. Uh, okay. Okay. What is the name of the American company that was, sorry, I, my page jumped, uh, that manufactured its first truck in 1907 and was pur- purchased by Volvo in the year 2000? American Truck Company first manufactured a truck in 1907, purchased by Volvo in 2000. Our choices are Freightliner, International, Mack, or Peterbilt. Okay, we will answer that at the end of the show. I confess I've already read it, so I'm disqualified. Um, mm-hmm. Let's let's jump right in. There's there's a couple things I wanted to get at here, uh, and the first is Ben Ben read this article about Saab. What did I see, Ben? Uh, if you're talking about the thing I put on our top secret Facebook group today, yeah. Uh, well, it's not re <laughs> it's sort of sob. I was disappointed to learn that there are no sobs going back into production. Uh maybe maybe if I, you know, win one of those billion dollar power balls or something, maybe I'll put <laughs> Saab or Studebaker or somebody back in business. Uh more likely Studebaker. But uh, what it was, what it amounted to was it's a Chinese made EV. Of course, all the hippest EVs now seem to be coming out of China, but this is a company that uh, through some machinations, wound up with the remnants of the last project that Saab did. Just before they folded, they were working on a uh, an EV prototype. And so the Saab engineers, they'd been acquired by another company and then eventually by the Chinese. And so they just kind of kept doing what they were doing. They kept working on this EV prototype. And then a, uh, a company called Protean got involved. And these guys are kind of pioneering the... Um, that's the best way to put it, the hub motor concept, you know, putting the motors in the wheels of the electric vehicles instead right. of a central motor with distributed power. Uh, of course, you know, the, as soon as I heard about hub motors, I thought, well, gee, the unsprung weight has got to be atrocious. You know, that's right. the enemy of good handling. But these guys have apparently figured out some ways around that. So, you know, all I saw was a 13 minute Top Gear video about this car. It's a prototype that called the Emily. You can still see some of the old Saab lines in it. Uh, but they loved it. And I thought, wow, that looks really, really cool. I'd like to drive one of those. Uh, but it'll be interesting to see what develops from, you know, the, from this. I've heard people talking about, you know, motors in the wheels with EVs for years, but this one seems to be one of the first ones that really does it and uh, apparently does it pretty successfully. Witchcraft. Yeah. <laughs> right. So do you know what the secret is, Ben? I just told uh, you. Well, it's a combination of things. Part of it is torque vectoring, which makes you know the individual wheels behave you know under power in different ways uh, that makes up for what would be some <laughs> horrible side effects of the mass at the corners. Sure. But also, there I believe there's a little bit of uh, you know a little bit of uh, software magic going on there. But the the thing that the guy from Protean said that I thought was interesting was that what they figured out was that it's not necessarily the total mass at each unsprung unit as much as the ratio of the unsprung mass to the vehicle's overall mass. And sure. since EVs are pretty heavy, then you can get away with a little more unsprung mass at the corners. Sure. Yeah. Are we allowed to say unsprung unit in this show? Uh, you can. If I, it, <laughs> I'm okay with it if you're okay with it. <laughs> I don't uh, think we just did. I mean, yeah, I don't yeah. 
I have this horrible, horrible vision in my head of, you know, one motor deciding to go forward and the other motor deciding to go backwards at the same time. And the car just kind of like, you know, splitting in two. Right. Right. Or I'm thinking of uh, when you hit a pothole, you know, one of those really big, bad potholes that can damage a wheel. Now are you also damaging your, your motor? Yes. Well, that's yeah. one of the things they talked about because this is not just something they cooked up and said, here, let's run with it. They did some pretty rigorous testing, including uh, outfitting some Land Rovers with it and bouncing them and thrashing them around through the mud and just really going to hell with them. Uh, they described one test where they spin the motor up to a pretty good speed and then dunk it in ice water something like 40 times at its full operating temperature. Uh, so, yeah, they're, they're putting in the, the durability testing for this. And so far, so good. Okay. okay. <laughs> Looks promising. Let's keep our yeah. eyes and ears peeled. Um, Misty, what's going on in F1 world? Oh, well, it's not just F1. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. it's like the whole FIA. This week uh, This week was um, uh, definitely a smorgasbord of amazing cars. We had uh, F3. Um, uh, we had F2. We had F1. F1 was also a sprint format, which is pretty new um mm -hmm. for f1 and it all took place in spa now spa is one of the historic tracks it's also probably one of the most dangerous tracks um oh. uh, it's been it was a couple of months ago that we lost a very young talented driver uh to spa um, oh. because in in spa it rains Sure. I mean, they've tried the the race in August they've tried the race in July I mean they could try the race in I don't I mean I it, I don't think it would matter which day they picked it's gonna rain um so there was um uh, yesterday in the sprint race uh for f2 we had a first time winner uh enzo fittipaldi who is the grandson of emerson fittipaldi um and on his way uh to park ferme uh i regret to inform everyone that phil the bollard was a casualty because he was confused <laughs> but that was the only mistake he made you know up to that point for the whole weekend um, yeah and e e even the announcers had a good laugh about that although they didn't name phil by name because we haven't informed them yet <laughs> and then today in f3 we had a milestone oh we did we had the first female driver to score points in F3, Sophia Flourish ah. finished in P7, nice. and I, th I think she, I think she gained 18 places. Wow! And Amazing. but that was not the most places gained. Um, I believe the most places gained was that uh, was 21, but I can't remember who it was. Okay, it yeah, might and have been the... Teo Pocher. Okay, and for those of you who might not know who Sophia Flourish is, if you've ever seen uh, the video from about five years ago. Uh, from the Macau Grand Prix of a Formula 3 car at the end of a straightaway, touching wheels with another car and then flying up over the Kench fencing into a photographer's stand. Uh, and that was her doing the flying and landing. Um, fortunately, there were no photographers in the photographer's stand at the time. Right. And uh, she escaped with, you know, relatively minor injuries. Yeah, she's um, a very talented young uh, German driver. Um, and throwing back to, uh, last week's, uh, recording, uh, they had Jamie Chadwick, uh, this, this, uh, t t t today on the, um, uh, uh, on, on the broadcast. Um, so, but yeah, spa was definitely interesting. There were, there were rain delays and rain delays, um, rain delays, <laughs> a rain delay, um, uh, Max Verstappen's engineer got a little cheeky with him after Max got cheeky with him back. Um, so that was, uh, there, 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 there was some passive aggressive going on, but it was rather humorous. Um, so yeah, it was a definitely an interesting weekend, but I was just, you know, I was literally sitting here this morning trying not to cheer too loud because everyone still wasn't up, you know, but to see Sophia come from, you know, way back in 20th something place all the way up to P7, you know, and, you know, she was able to score a total of six points uh, and is now the first female driver to have scored points in uh, Formula 3. Yeah, that's impressive. Very exciting. Very exciting. Yeah, I thought that was really awesome, especially coming on the tail end of the conversation last week with uh, Loxley. 
Well, and not only that, but you shared this other thing. What did, did Danica Patrick have to say about women in science or something? Uh, what, was it, it wasn't women in science. It was women in racing. You know, something about how, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't even remember the exact quote, and I really don't care to because I'm extremely disappointed, you know, because Danica is a, definitely a premier driver in NASCAR and Indy right. uh, and actually holds a few records. I think she's like one of like only 14 drivers to have uh, led both the Indy 500 and the Daytona or something. It's off the top of my head. I can't, you know, don't always remember everything. Yeah, that sounds um, right. And um, she was, uh, last week they were doing um, like the F1 kids. So they had three young people, um, uh, two young men and a young woman who were absolutely amazing. I was like, can we just keep these and like, you know, get rid of like Damon Hill, please? <laughs> um <laughs> And uh, she was apparently talking with uh, with one of the young, w- with the young woman, and they were talking about women in racing. And she made some remark uh, to the effect of, "Yeah, you know, racing is just you know really an aggressive sport, and that's just not a very feminine mindset." Hmm. And I was Which like, is a "Really was like, poor choice of words at best." Yeah, yeah, because yeah. yeah. because my first thought was, "Have you met me?" <laughs> right. You know, I'm like. Uh, you know, and, and and but then to say that, you know, especially on international TV as a women driver, you know, as, 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 you know, as a woman driver, you know, are you saying that you're not feminine or are you saying that? Or you know, she thought she lacked the aggressiveness to, to be a, a, you know, a consistent top place finisher? Yeah. You know, I mean, so so either way, you know, you're kind of shooting all of us, you know, in the back. And I was just, I was just really, really disappointed, um, you know, and uh, I, yeah, kind of confused, you know, because yeah, I'm yeah. sitting here going, why would you say that? Well, let's, let's hope that she doesn't make a habit of that. And we, we hope that, you know, women in particular don't have to agree with her. So, right. yeah, anyway, because, yeah. because I've, I've really been enjoying watching because, you know, every few races that they'll actually on, on Sky Sports, especially they'll actually show the um, F1 Academy, which is all young women drivers. Mm-hmm. Um, and you talk about competitive. Sure. I mean, you know, the, these, these young women are out there and they are just, I mean, they are fighting for it. And I think the F1 Academy is driving an F3 cars, aren't they? I believe so. No, I, think it I don't is. know if they're frontline F3 cars. They might be F3 regional, which might have some, yeah. like a, kind of what Formula W had done before, but I'm, I'm yeah. not 100% sure. You know, but still, I mean, you know, th- these are young women that are out there and just really, you know, blood, sweat, and tears getting these cars down the track and, and doing an amazing job. Yeah. So, so yeah, that's, right. um, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of disappointing. And, um, you know, maybe as soon as I find, a, you know, a, a spare minute where I, I'm actually quite sure if I'm, you know, if, if I need to uh, scratch my watch or wind my ass, um, I'm sure I will approach Danica on social media and go, excuse me. I'm sorry, what? Wrong. Yeah, this is wrong. <laughs> Let us know how that goes. I would be curious to see if you actually do it and if she actually responds. Um, so definitely Probably mention not. us. Tell her we talked about her on this episode. Yeah, <laughs> I will. Um, I will. Ben and I had a note from a good friend of ours, Robert Drake, who um, who had an incident recently and Robert's been on the show before to talk about a couple of minor car things, but this time his car died while he was away from home. Um, still in the same city, but uh, AAA, he is a AAA member. Um, AAA says that, well, the long story short is he originally called AAA around 1230 in the morning, so 1230 a.m., and they didn't come get him until after 7 a.m. Wow. So he was stuck there all night, which... I'm like, first of all, okay, if you're stuck somewhere, call me. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, but, but the questions he's got here is uh, uh, AAA at one point actually suggested he call a private towing company and the private towing company sh- took his money apparently via a credit card transaction. I'm not sure what, and then declined to tow him for reasons I don't understand. So he's going to challenge those charges if they actually appear on his credit card. But in the meantime, AAA promised repeated times and they kept on delaying. So Robert's question is why can't AAA get their act together and provide towing in a reasonable time? Is there such a short of tow truck drivers that we should all be in that business. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> so I'm like, you know, I wouldn't, you know, I, I've always wanted a, a flatbed tow truck for no good reason at all. Maybe this is a good reason. 
Yeah. You just want to reenact Repo Man. That's true. <laughs> okay. Not let's, wrong. Let's go get sushi yeah. and not pay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, in our business, um, we uh, we often deal with uh, companies that haul different type vehicles in different manners, uh, whether it be in the the big semi pulled car haulers or individual tow companies, and uh, they're always the sketchiest of ones to deal with. I will I will say. Really? Yes. Tow truck drivers are sketchy. Um, Companies are sketchy. A little, well, a little bit of both. Where, yeah, I'm. I'm a little surprised. I mean, I, I shouldn't be having dealt with a sketchy tow truck company, but, <laughs> but you know, the others I've met were seemed like pretty much on the up and up. I, you know, they wanted to provide a service. They did. I paid for it. End of story. You know, right. and uh, yeah. but I'm, I'm, I'm a little surprised that that they're generally more sketchy than not. Or yeah, I would say that it's it's sort of like a. You know, there's 50% of them are awesome, and then there's the the other 50%. There's a, a big downward slope where, uh, yeah, the yeah. they just tend to tend tend to be. I don't know. They kind of fly by the, night, and uh, you know, just bad about paying bills and uh, not understanding terms of service agreements. And apparently, as as your friend was dealt with, not properly understanding their terms of service and whether or not they're going to be able to complete a task. But don't you think that's probably true for any kind of service area where um, people tend to panic, you know, like your car's broken down, the key broke off in your lock, um, your air conditioning died. Thinking of you, Dave, miss you. Seriously. Yeah. Um, You know, or, uh, you know, your dishwasher's broken, your washing machine is leaking, your toilet's clogged, you know, anything like that where there's this sense of urgency. Mm-hmm. You know, you have some people, you know, you have, I would say, half or more of the people that are in it because they want to make a difference, you know, because they like what they do, except for maybe the plumbers. Um, <laughs> you know, and then the other half are just in it because they know they can charge big bucks. You know, they, they know they can charge you 150 insert currency here. Um just for crawling out of bed or just for showing up. Right. You know, and if you don't like their service, tough crap, you've already paid their 150 insert currency here. Um, so you can go call somebody else and pay another 150 insert currency here. Right. And, you know, to be fair, uh, the service that we provide is to these tow truck drivers or to any kind of and car hauler companies is in the same vein where, Yes, we, we get paid a, 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 a upwards of $150 just to show up. And, you know, there's always a process of going through, here's our terms of service. Here's the condition that your equipment needs to be in in order for us to work on it. And, you know, if you, you know, think that for some reason don't make that, that proper, you know, allowance or understanding of your own equipment, uh, you know, you have to charge us for sh- showing up, you know, it's, because you know you called us and you have it turns out you have an electrical problem and not a problem that our company deals with you know because you don't understand your equipment you called the wrong people uh, yeah well but you know as far as a, a tow truck company not being able to tow a vehicle a lot of times uh, you know when I think of that like on my previous cars I had a, an aftermarket air dam that uh, blocked the access to the tow hooks. And, you know, you can't tow a, a to haul a car up onto a flatbed trailer unless you can access those tow hooks or, you know, or you're going to damage the bodywork somewhere on the vehicle. So it becomes a little tricky at a point like that. Yes, yeah, so I guess that's the question, Mickey. Did your friend have aftermarket bodywork that <laughs> caused the on, issue? On that car, no. And with that driver, Robert, no. Robert's probably the last person in the world to do anything aftermarket to any of his cars. It's like he doesn't even put like a bumper sticker on it. Okay, a bumper sticker. That would be the limit of his uh, uh, adventure modifications. Modifications, yeah. yes. In fact, I think he has a conspicuancy tape on the back of his car, and that's pretty much it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Wow. A little reflective white and orange thing that, or white and red thing that goes across the back of his car. Um, but so, yeah, I don't know. I, and I don't know what AAA has got in mind. I know AAA has always had a series of delays. Maybe that night was a particularly bad night for AAA. Maybe they were short staffed on drivers, but it does sort of raise the question. Every time that I've called AAA, there's always been a, roughly a 90 to a two hour delay on getting anybody to, to respond, Never mind get a tow. Um, yeah. but you know, so if, if the demand is that high, is it worth it for AAA to hire another driver or two for this area? 
Yeah, but the question is, can they get, you know, because we've all noticed in the U.S., especially people my age, <clears throat> um, over the past, I would say, 15 to 20 years, there's been the huge shift of, you know, of, uh, you know, get a good job to you have to go to university or you have to go to college to get a good job, um, you know, and while absolutely nothing wrong with tow truck drivers and i think you know i mean that they're, they're a necessity just like electricians just like plumbers um you know there's probably a shortage uh you know of people that a want to drive and b are willing to get called in the middle of the night now as a customer service manager and supervisor i'm gonna sit here and i'm gonna literally on air call out AAA for not having the ability to properly communicate lead times you know, communicate. Right. Yeah. It makes your yeah. life makes your life easier. And then you don't have stuff like people talking about um, you know, the fact that someone had to wait uh, basically a full work day for a tow. And as right. well as now having to go back and spend more time uh disputing credit card charges. Which is why I'm hoping it's a statistical outlier for Robert's sake or for all of our sakes, yeah. because I've never had I've called AAA a handful of times. I've never had that kind of a problem with them. Um, not seven hours anyway, certainly, certainly a couple here and there, but, but not seven hours. That just seems a bit extreme. Right. So. Yeah. In the whole world of nut and bolt service personnel, uh, you know, it's a, a, a vastly understaffed segment of, in our workforce because yeah, when I went to, to high school, you know, everybody had to be on that college university, uh, track and <laughs> those of us who, you know, well, I should say those who weren't on that track were always kind of often looked down upon. But you know, yeah. now are we're we're top heavy on people who have college degrees and not a proper uh, avenue in which to to use those degrees, and we're short on people who could with a uh, you know a year or two of uh, training at a technical college mm -hmm. can go out and be making seventy five to one hundred thousand dollars in you know turning yeah. nuts and turning right. wrenches. I think we're definitely overstaffed with middle management, um, <laughs> yeah. you know, and, uh, you know, 100% certainly light on the electricians and the plumbers and the, uh, you know, uh, landscape, you know, I mean, people that go and do with their hands. And be great. You know, Have uh, you guys uh, seen any of the uh, Canadian tow truck driver shows that the Weather Channel runs? No, no, yeah. but I, I think yeah, they run them like at ten o'clock to midnight on weeknights or whatever. It's a two or three or four different shows about tow truck operators in Canada, and they sure make it look cool. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> Can you be an unscrupulous Canadian tow truck driver? Is that legal? That's a good question. Yeah, that may actually be like considered high treason. <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, I think I'm, I'm sorry. Some... I can't tow your your truck out of that ravine. I'm really sorry. Eh? Yeah. Hey. yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> I think um, I saw one something similar, and not necessarily it wasn't necessarily tow truck drivers; it was more recovery drivers, like in Norway. Oh wow! Yeah, in Norway, I think in the episode I saw they had to. They, it was like a truck that had like flipped over, and so they were trying to lift it with the air cushions. And then there was right. another one where it was a refrigerated truck that had broke down. So and it had like meat or something in it so like everybody was coming along to help you know they weren't looting the meat okay but they were like <laughs> coming to help move it to like another you know another smaller truck that had shown up to you know replace oh, yeah. this one that had broken down yeah and Canadian I'm like, shows. sorry didn't mean to cut you off there the canadian shows do a lot of that too there's one i've seen a couple times where this dump truck that weighs something like forty thousand pounds has gone ass end first down almost a vertical cliff like 200 feet below the road which is a dirt road up in the mountains and these guys pull the thing out the two big giant trucks and a whole mm -hmm. lot of you know a lot of drama with you know well is it going to work or is it not going to work or what was that noise you know but I they got it out actually, of there i might have actually seen that one where it was like being like held up basically by a tree I think so. Yeah, they wound up having to cut a bunch of trees from under it. They had to risk their lives to go underneath to release the air brakes. Uh -huh. and then they had a clever plan to use the laid down trees as kind of a ramp to get it over the boulders. And yeah, it was really. Something. I swear, I've seen that one, and I was just sitting there going, "Wow!" You know, because because <laughs> yeah. if, if that had happened in the U.S., there would have been at least one of the incidents of, "Hey, y'all, watch this!" Right? <laughs> yeah. You know, and probably at least two of. Hold my beer. 
Hold my beer. <laughs> so I've got this joke just to wrap up this little talk about the, the Roberts issue, which I'm not really sure we've shed any light on at all. But uh, um, but um, I disagree. So, Sorry, sorry, Robert, uh, or maybe you're welcome, Robert. I'm not sure which one replies. Um, <laughs> so this this uh, brain surgeon needs a plumber, and he hires a plumber. Uh, plumber comes over to the house, fixes the problem, and presents the bill. Uh, brain surgeon's like, holy mackerel, I'm a brain surgeon, and I don't make that kind of money. And the plumber says, I know. I used to be a brain surgeon. <laughs> See? Very yeah. good point. So, Very good point. You know. Yes, there we go. Last I thing I want to talk about before we wrap the episode. I'm sorry, Misty. Oh, no, I was just going to say, I've actually started to see recently a lot of, you know, it feels like I've seen a lot of stories of people that were like, you know, oh, I, I was a manager, you know, or oh, I was this high flying banker or something. And then I just kind of got tired of it and gave it all up to be like a beekeeper. And, you know, now I'm yeah. just like immensely happier. People are getting right. tired of the BS that comes along with corporate culture in general, I yeah. think. And, and it's and it's not just working, obviously, because people want to work, people need to work. But corporate culture has gotten uh, uh, debunked, so, if I can say. It's just it's just people recognize the BS that's went in. They're tired of it. And I'm frankly glad to see the change. I'm glad yeah. to see people saying, you know, giving the finger to their old workplaces and not putting up with you know yeah. bad work habits anymore. I'm, so, I'm, I'm really glad that we're starting to push back against the toxicity which is i mean that's what it is you know that's right that's exactly I mean, if, right if, if, if you hear people say you know and and i guess for me living here um you know because i'm i'm literally required to take 20 vacation days minimum a year okay so that's a minimum yeah. of four weeks and um <laughs> and um uh, you know and to hear people say you know oh i haven't had a vacation in like five years i'm like that ain't quite the flex you think that is you know because i'm just right yeah That's exactly right and i'm so glad to see people pushing back against that because that work-life balance you know i mean it is just so important you yep. know and i and i can definitely say that i am in a much better place mentally you know than i ever was working in the u.s yeah, the U.S. has some real reckoning to have happen amongst the corporate world, and I, uh, there's a, a lot of growing discontent. And I hope it continues to, I hope it continues to blow up and burn. You know, yes, frankly, because so we need changes. Americans, we are now calling upon you to become bollards. <laughs> <laughs> Just hope we don't get run over. That's right. Yeah, no one, yeah. no one will all benefit. You, yeah. Did you say you have to watch out for those little short Brazilians? <laughs> yeah. All right. Last thing before we wrap the episode and answer the trivia question is I saw this thing on Reddit. Um, I thought it was a pretty decent question. So this person is looking at a replacement axle on Reddit and he's like, is there any reason why the Duralast version of this axle costs almost three times the price of the other one, which is on Rock Auto? And if you look very closely, the pictures of the axles are identical. It is the same part right? Um, it is exactly the same part, probably from the same manufacturer even. Um, but the Rock Auto one is almost one third the price of the Duralast one. So the question was any valid reason why this should be the case. And I think there are decent reasons why, but what do you guys think? Three times uh, the price. Yes. The, the big question for me is, is the more expensive one a brand new axle or is it a rebuilt axle? And a lot of times people will not take the time to, to look to see if that there is a difference there because uh you know drive axles are rebuildable um but depending on the method in which they're rebuilt there's a the quick and cheap method and then there's the uh top of the line expensive method and uh the longevity you will get under harsh uh, driving conditions uh would would will make the, the more expensive one worth it um and vice versa sure yeah, and and normally i'm like you know look I, I know like that can of corn you know in the grocery store you know the store wait brand a minute, is, wait a minute is, wait a minute hold on minute. it's an axle and a can of corn uh, <laughs> can i, I can't, finish i can't can wait I to finish? hear the connection between you're the gonna two see here. you know because <laughs> I, I i know that that can of corn you know there, there, there there's two cans of corn you know there's mm -hmm. the the really expensive you know mark you know a mark and then there's the store brand i know that more than likely those are produced in the same factory and they're the same thing but on the other hand if this store brand can of corn is slightly you know not maybe up to the same spec as the the a mark if it kind of like breaks it's not going to kill me or we hope 
Right. You know, or or at least it's not going to sling me down the highway at 75 miles an hour doing, you know, while I'm channeling Simon and Garfunkel slip sliding away. <laughs> you know, so I, th I think that's the difference, you know, and, and you know, it, it's very seldom that I will say I will buy the brand name, the, yeah. you know, the, the well-known name over, uh, you know, the store brand or the the off-brand mark every single time. Sure. Um, I mean, the issue of responsibility is still there. Rock Auto still has to be responsible for their stuff. Their manufacturer, whoever Rock Auto gets their stuff from, has a certain amount of responsibility and liability as well. Well, I think that's where part of this comes in because I'm not sure, you know, Tim made some valid points, but I'm not sure the difference is worth that much. And I, I think it may have a little bit to do with uh, just the way the two businesses operate because your Duralast part is going to come from an AutoZone or an O'Reilly or somewhere like that. Whereas Rock Auto is a big giant aggregator that has a very efficient internet based you know business. So, <laughs> and to answer Tim's earlier point, there's no information here on remanufacturing versus new. So I think for the purposes of our discussion, let's assume they're both new. Right. Yeah. And are be. you talking about exclusively buying online? Or are you talking about I'm looking at this drawer last one in the advanced auto, so I can actually look at it and see if it's maybe a little wonky versus. Yeah only being able to order it online. Right. Because um, right. that's another thing too with car parts. I'm still, you know, unless it's just like a lens cover or a steering wheel cover. I mean, if it's a functioning part that is required to keep the car on the road, preferably on the road safely. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I still, you know, call me old. Everybody else does because I kind of am. <laughs> um, but for me, that's one of the ones that I, you know, I want to go and I want to look at it. Is there something that maybe doesn't feel right about it? You know, is there this big honking oil stain on the packaging that, you know, instead of trying to order it, get it in, send it back? Ugh. Well, that's right. one and of the, to, to yeah. Ben's point. Um, you know, yeah, like you said, Rock Auto ships out of you know what, maybe five to ten locations across the U.S. So when you buy from them, you're also paying for the the shipping to your house or wherever right. whereas you know you buy it at the local auto store that's already been aggregated into the cost of the item right right rock auto does tack on shipping that is true especially for something like an axle which is not a lightweight piece of metal but the shipping isn't worth two-thirds of the of the auto zone <laughs> price Bingo. right that's true so, so here's but. one of the better answers that i read here uh on on the reddit post but this person's posits he says he says you're paying, or he or she says that you're paying for the three times the price for the lifetime warranty, which Rock Auto doesn't give you, Duralas does, the convenience of buying it on the spot and returning it, which is another big piece of it, to Ben's point about the business model of Rock Auto versus, you know, uh, versus AutoZone or whoever sells Duralast. Um, uh, so, you know, I think those two things alone are a big piece of the puzzle there. That's why Duralast charges more. They've covered shipping. They're offering you a huge warranty that you don't get with Rock Auto and you can conveniently return the thing, which you don't get to do with Rock Auto, which requires more, you know, more hoops to jump through if you want to return something to them. Um, yeah. Not to mention yeah. paying, paying return shipping. And I'm sure if Rock Auto offered a warranty, you would pay more, you know, like the total aggregate price after shipping and the extended warranty would be at least level, if not more, yeah. than the Duralast model. Yep. But that's my opinion. So anyway, good stuff. So if people need to buy parts, here's the here's the thousand dollar question, which may not be answerable based on this conversation. Should I go to the auto parts store and get it, or should I go to Rock Auto and get it? <laughs> the answer is uh, like so many things with vehicles. It depends. It depends. Yeah, right. it, yeah. it depends. You know, I mean, I, I mean, like I said, you know, are we talking about, you know, maybe a replacement motor for, you know, your driver's side window? You know, one would hope that it wouldn't spin out of right. control and, you know, <laughs> goes zipping <laughs> off across. Um, you know, is it, you know, a fuse? Those um, I would probably buy online, you know. Yeah. But, you know, simple stuff that's not going to directly impact the safe yeah. handling of the car that's um, my thing if it's a if it's a life and death thing i'll probably go oem and preferably yeah. in person and and uh, otherwise if it's not a life and death thing i'll definitely do the price hunting thing online right yeah. and how soon do you need it you know can right. you wait two or three days for shipping right so all right trivia czar tim please let's answer the question for today and let's wrap our episode 
Okay. So the question again, what is the name of the American truck company that manufactured its first truck in 1907 and was purchased by Volvo in the year 2000? Is it A, Freightliner, B, International, C, Mack, or D, Peterbilt? Uh, so let's see, Ben, what say if you? Uh, I say it'd be Mac. Okay. Uh, Misty? I'm going to say international because before you even started listing the choices, I went, that sounds like international. I don't <laughs> know where that came from. It just, it was a light bulb moment, but I'm going to dance with the one that brung me. Okay. And Mickey, do you remember? I do remember. Yeah. So You, you want me to give the answer? Sure. That's the a, answer well, is, because I had a similar thought as Misty. I'm like, uh, my first thought was international and my I was always taught stick with your first gut answer because uh, most of the time that's correct but in this case the answer is mac right and mac uh, had inspired the name of one of the pixar characters in the movie cars so yeah, yeah. So, so, nice well. good stuff i haven't actually seen a mac truck or at least i'm not aware that i've seen a mac truck on the road in oh, a while have. i'm sure yeah, yeah they, well they, they've got modern slick styling like all the other ones and i have driven past i don't know if it's their number one corporate office or just one of the ones but somewhere in the carolinas i've driven past one several times it's really slick looking place hmm. and the trucks Ooh. they're making are really cool now and one of the things i read about them uh is probably no longer true but at some point in the 90s they actually designed their trucks so that chassis and cabs across a span of something like 60 years were interchangeable wow that yeah. sounds amazing. You could actually put a 90s cab on a 30s chassis or vice versa if you were crazy enough. <laughs> that is crazy. That sounds like I, I, I probably awesome. actually would have gone the other way, you know, because yeah. I want the durability yeah. of the 90s model, but I want the really cool retro styling of the 30s. Right. Yeah. See, now that, 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 that's how I would go. Yeah, well, that's a pretty cool company. Trucking itself is huge. I don't, yeah. uh, and it's, I didn't realize how huge it is, but it's massive. You know, the, uh, you, you tend not to realize it until all of a sudden you're faced with the numbers and you're like, wow, how many billions of dollars are tied up just in getting things from point A to point B and how much of that involves trucking. So If you would come to the Netherlands, you know, because, I mean, that's the history of the Netherlands. You have the Netherlands at one point in time, yeah. you know, and I hate to address this because it's not pretty history necessarily. But at one point in time, the Netherlands was the only country allowed to trade with Japan. Because they're like, look, we don't care about religion. We just want to take your money. <laughs> they, they, they had a global yeah. empire that rivaled, yeah. you know, England uh, with. I'm not going to say entirely, you know, entirely missing, um, you know, the violent colonialism, but significantly less. Right. Um, because they were just like, you know, look, we don't care. We just right. want your money. You know, we just want. You know, we just want to bring stuff. You know, and you know that the. the Port of Rotterdam is, you know, one of the biggest harbors, you know, in, in Europe. Right. Yeah. And it's actually the not Dutch East India Company. Yes. Yeah. The Dutch, and it's actually exactly. not not too far from where I work. Hmm. We do need to get to the Netherlands. There's so many places we need to go, but we need yep. a sponsor. So if you can sponsor us and we can create some good entertainment out of it, I, you know, please give me a call. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder right. if uh, we should court a manufacturer of bollards. <laughs> I, you know, well, I mean, actually, you know, that makes maybe. more sense than I wanted to, Ben. Let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> or, or, you know, or, or let, 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 let's reach out to Venom Sport Racing. Yeah. You know, which yeah. is yeah. a Dutch team. And, you know, let's, hey, you know, hey, let's get these Americans over here and show them what <laughs> racing's actually about. It's not just going around in an oval, people. That's right. That's right. You know, so, so, uh, let's so, make yeah. it happen. Let's try to make it happen. Maybe well, this like will be I the said, year. Yeah, you know, like I said, if y'all fly into Amsterdam, you know, we'll take the train to Paris, and then we've got planes, trains, and at least one automobile in there, because exactly. I'm sure we'll take a taxi. Exactly. Yeah, the French the truckers won't be on strike. <laughs> you know, literally, I think, the you know, the, the last time there were protests, you know, I have a friend that lives in Paris, and he was like, well, all of my American friends just stop freaking out. And, you know, yes, there's protests. And I was like... I was like, hmm, mm. there's protests in France. Do you know what that mm. means? And a uh, friend of mine was like, it must be spring, <laughs> you know, which which is pretty accurate, you know, which is, mm -hmm. is pretty accurate, you know. So, yeah, it's, uh, you know, but if I want to say, you know, if public transportation in France is on strike, we can always get those little scooters and, you know, just, uh, you know, be like super cool. Yeah, I'm going to need a heavy duty one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they make those. It's okay. You know, we'll, right. we'll just have to get you one of the old-fashioned Vespas, you know, that's exactly. made out of like you know 
Oh, that would be sweet. That would be awesome. So thanks again to our listening audience for hanging with us for the last 40 something minutes. We really appreciate your time and enthusiasm. If you have suggestions for the show, please find our website, the thing about cars.com. Uh, and please join us next week for a brand new episode and probably even more trivia. And maybe Dave will be back from his, um, non air conditioned. Yeah. He'll have fix his air conditioning problems and maybe Don will be here. We'll have the whole gang. I hope anyway, uh, be safe. Y'all stay cool or warm, whatever you prefer. We'll see you again in about a week. See ya. Uh, bye now. Ciao. Thank you for listening. This has been the thing about cars. We'll see you on the road.